Attempting something new this semester. I always try to do several new things this, uh, the, this semester, hopefully uh, for the good of the class. What I'm trying new this semester is I'm going to record or do my best to record my lectures and then make them available to you in case you want to rewatch them, um, in case you miss lecture, although I will strongly advise you to attend lecture. Um, and uh, pretty much everything about how this class runs is being pushed into your other class meeting for today. For those of you who were, who were here for discussion this morning, you know what I mean. For those of you who will be here for the lab portion this afternoon, you will soon know what I mean. Uh, and today, I'm more or less going to lecture on new material. A little bit of review, um, as I will say uh, and have said this morning, but as I will say this afternoon, lecture time is uh, gold to me. It is very valuable and uh, therefore I use it all to actually lecture. I do have a couple days where I give exams. Um, and anybody who's just coming in, if you don't have the lecture handed out from today, I passed it out this morning for the rest of the um, Now, uh, with that, my lecture style is that uh, I uh, put my PowerPoint lecture outlines on the board. Uh, I have given you the first PowerPoint lecture outline. Uh, well, I just moved it over by the door. If you don't have it, you do need it, because I'm going to start lecturing from it. And then we're going to fill out the lecture outlines in the lectures as we go. Um, and as I mentioned this morning, and I'll mention again, I tend to use up to three different colors on my lecture notes. And you may want to have three colors available to you or more, or, you know, it's, it's your call. Uh, any questions before we get started today? Yes? Where are you going to be putting the videos up at? Good question. So um, they will be on my YouTube channel. Um, not collecting much money from it yet, but wait till these lectures get up there. Uh, and there will be a link on the CAM 400 website, which is listed near the top of the syllabus. Any other questions? Good, okay. All right, uh, then I will dim the lights. Uh, might as well say this too. Uh, attendance at lecture is uh, optional. So uh, you are attending lecture because you think it is valuable for you to be here. I don't take role, I don't assign points for it. I do, however, uh, give out hints on the exam sometimes or talk about what the exam is going to be like. Uh, I already did that a little bit this morning when in the, the two hour portion I said, those of you just coming in there is a, the, the most important handout is right over there because uh, I'm using that as my lecture notes today. Uh, but I also passed it out this morning as well. Um, what, what the, the lecture or the, the exam hint that I gave this morning was the more you see something in this class, the more likely you are to see it on the exam. For example, when we do an empirical formula problem today a little bit later, and then you see one in lecture and you see one in discussion or a couple of them in discussion, and then you see a couple of them on your homework, your written homework, um, surprise there's a high likelihood that it'll be on your exam. So we say things like that. Um, and it is my goal in providing my lecture, the videos of the lectures, that that's an opportunity for you to review the material and hear it again. Um, I mean, I guess if nobody, if everybody watched the videos and nobody came to lecture, then I would probably stop making the videos. But, um, uh, and, and I will say this too. A student asked me to do it, and I figured it out. So uh, the student said, I'd love to watch them again. And so I started doing it last semester for my second semester, general chemistry class, um, Chem 401. So, uh, those of you just coming in, there are some handouts right on that desk there. Uh, the rest of them you can pick up later, but that's the one you need to know. Uh, all right, so where are we? Uh, the other thing I do is I uh, do two of them at a time. We'll start here. And I'll write right on the board. Uh, lecture one, chapter three. Oh, and one more thing I should say. So there is no class this Wednesday 
because I will be at a conference. There is no class on Monday, next Monday, because it's a holiday. So after today, the next time you will see me, unless you come to office hours, is uh, oh, nine days from now. Um, and my change in office hours, because I leave tomorrow afternoon for the conference, I will change my office hours to 8.30 to 10.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, and as always, I encourage you to come to them and ask as many questions as possible, get as many of your homework answers uh, checked off as possible before you turn it in. Okay, so uh, formulas of each element, uh, each of the elements in its lowest energy state. Most elements have the atom as their lowest energy state. Uh, for example, Na. Uh, now let's turn to our periodic table up here. Um, and if we look at the periodic table, and of course you'll have the periodic table on all your exams, um, some of the elements have black lettering, others have red, and a uh, few of them even have blue, and several of them are even ghosted out or outlined. When an element is black on the periodic table there, does anybody know what that means? At room temperature and pressure, its lowest energy state is the solid phase. That's right. And so I look at number 11 over there. It's got black lettering. It's a solid. Okay. What about red? Anybody know what I call red? Gases. And, it's, and these are, again, lowest energy states at room temperature and pressure. Okay. Uh, blue? Liquid. Liquid. Uh, outlines? Unstable. All of the uh, isotopes of those elements are radioactive. Um, and so, they, or another way of looking at it is those elements are not naturally occurring on Earth because any of them that existed have radioactively decayed away. Now, what does it mean to be radioactive versus what does it mean to be stable? That's another question because uranium apparently is stable, but it is also radioactive. However, the half-life, so you can find uranium naturally occurring on Earth, and usually it's oxide forms, and if you've ever been to uh, the Moab, uh, Utah area, they have uranium, closed uranium mines there. Um, but it turns out the half-life, meaning the amount of time before half of it is gone, is on the order of billions of years. So yes, it's radioactive, but yes, it exists. And so another way of looking at um, the, uh, well, anything but the ghosted ones or the outlined ones is that the, you can find them naturally occurring. So, any questions about that? Well, uh, let's come back to sodium. Sodium, uh, we're talking about uh, an atom, so it has just a single atom. It is a solid. We can tell that from the periodic table. Um, we could do the same thing for a cadmium as well. We do the, um, there are seven diatomic elements. Can anybody tell me all seven of them? Yes. Hydrogen, oxygen. Chlorine, chlorine. 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 Chlorine, Two polyatomic elements. Um, well, let's say this. So you do have to know that all the elements are atoms, except the seven diatomic elements. There are two polyatomics, and if these ever come up, you don't have to memorize them. I would tell you what their formulas are, and that would be phosphorus tends to be in its lowest energy form, P4, and uh, sulfur tends to be S8. Although, what we will find is that in chemistry, chemistry is like an onion. 
It has layers. <laughs> and one of those layers would be, let's just call all of the elements like this, like sulfur S8, although there, it, it's, there are other phases and states of sulfur as well. But this is the lowest energy one of uh, them. Chemistry is like an onion. And as we go deeper and deeper into Chem 400 and beyond, you'll see we peel those layers back and things get more complicated. And so what I'm trying to teach you, by the way, and I'll say this several times, uh, well, let's go through some of my trademark comments here. One is, um, uh, what I'm going to teach you in Chem 400 is greater than 90% true, but there will be exceptions, right? Because think of this as your first real college level class in chemistry for many of you. And we want to get the basics down. And so, for example, we'll talk about solubility in chapter four. And we will consider things as soluble or insoluble, but you can better believe that as we peel back the layers and you go in the chemistry 401, there are things that are slightly soluble. But we won't talk about them in Chem 400. We'll put things in broadly two categories and pretend that everything's simple like that so that we can work and understand a lot of the chemistry in Chem 400. Okay. That's one example. The other thing I'll say many times, and I said it this morning and I will be sure to say it this afternoon, chemistry, is hard enough when you get all of your questions answered. It is almost infinitely harder when you don't. And so ask questions. Uh, I encourage questions in lecture. I answer as many of them as I can. Every once in a while I'll say, hey, I'm gonna refer that to office hours or after class. Um, sometimes because we, we do wanna make sure we get through uh, material, but. It is true that if you have a question, lots of other people probably have that same question as well. So, um, yeah. good. Uh, all right. Um, allotropes is a term that talks about different forms of the same element. For example, carbon. I didn't put the other parenthesis there on purpose. We're going to talk about two different forms of carbon solid. Does anybody know a form or both forms of carbon solid? Somebody says, I just, somebody says something like that. Well, you know, familiar with diamond. Diamond is pure carbon. Yeah. Graphite. Graphite, also pure carbon. When you work with carbon at Sac City College, can you guess which form of carbon you're going to use? Graphite. Yeah, it's graphite. Um, but they're both, and so uh, these are examples of two allotropes of carbon. They're, and we'll discuss bonding later on. They have different types of bonding, different types of covalent bonding, it turns out. Um, all right. Uh, oh, but they're both elements because they're both only carbon. Oxygen gas, ozone. Only oxygen, two different forms. Question? And they're both covalent? Uh, those are both covalent as well, yeah. Good. Now, um, of these two, and why not? There's another one. Just oxygen atoms. Uh, of these, which is the lowest energy form of oxygen? O2, right. Diatomic, that's what the periodic table tells us. It's a gas in its lowest energy form. We memorize that it's diatomic, and that is the lowest energy form. These are also gases, but not the lowest energy form. Can anybody care to guess? Graphite or diamond, which is the lowest energy form of carbon? It is graphite at room temperature and pressure. Although, at the pressure and temperature at which diamonds were formed in the Earth's crust, diamond was lower in energy, and so that's why it formed. Uh, again, peeling back those layers, things are coming. 
Um, good. Any questions about this? Uh, I think mostly pressure. It pushes them slightly closer together. Uh, but temperature also makes things go faster, too. So I imagine that helps, even if it doesn't end up, even if pressure is the driving force. Uh, good. Heading over to the second slide, uh, formulas of ions. Memorize ions from the nomenclature handout for upcoming quiz. In your syllabus, page four is a schedule. On that schedule, it says your nomenclature quiz will be in week three during your discussion section. That's the two-hour portion of lab. If we call it discussion, we call it dry lab. There's a two-hour and a four-hour section. All the wet chemistry is done in the four-hour section. And so, um, and in fact, we'll do wet chemistry uh, this afternoon in our first lab session for the Monday people. Mm -hmm. uh, Trends and charges of monatomic ions as we go from uh, the chloride ion to the sulfide ion to the nitride ion. We notice a trend in the change in charges. So uh, all these ions, what's the charge on these ions? Negative one. Negative or negative one. These oxygen, sulfur in particular, negative two. Nitride, negative three. Come over to the other side of the periodic table. Group one forms ions of what charge? Positive one. Plus one. Group two? Positive two. Positive two. Aluminum in particular? Positive three. Positive three. What about the transition metals? Yeah. Differs, it depends. Some of them have two different options. Some of them have one. Um, and, you know, largely, that's our review of nomenclature in Chem 400, because at least you're, you're supposed to know that from Chem 300. If you didn't take Chem 300, and you're taking the placement exam, then might I suggest that you hit the uh, nomenclature sheet. It's in the People's Guide, which you're required to buy. Well, it's recommended that you buy anyway. I don't think I can really require anything of you. Um, but uh, it's not a philosophy class, it's a chemistry class. Um, the nomenclature sheet is also on the Chem 400 website if you want to get a preview. And I suggest making your own flashcards um, to help you memorize them. That's what helps me when I way back in the day. Good. Uh, so, oh, um, I, you know, technically when you list the charges of plus two, minus two, etc., it's a good idea to list the two and then the plus or the two and, and then the minus. It's a convention, though, that I, I, I don't require. So if you list it as minus two, I'm not going to work it anymore. Um, formulas of ionic solids, there are no discrete molecules. That's why the term is formula unit um, and not molecule. Molecules are, is a word that we'll use to describe the road, covalently bonded compounds. Formula unit is for ionic compounds. And um, pictures here, we draw this. I, in fact, I would draw this probably a couple times for you throughout this semester. Uh, one as soon as about your third lecture. But this is a simplified representation of what's called the 3D unit cell and really repeats ad infinitum in different directions. If you've ever seen a grain of salt, it's got millions and billions of these little uh, sodium ions and chloride ions in a regular pattern, three-dimensional order. So another aspect of the uh, chemistry is like an onion with layers, is we will only be able to draw this, but we need to be able to think about the other, the other pictures. Any questions about that? Well, the next thing we do is uh, we move on to the next slide. The next slide. You know, uh, I'm, I'm slowly going uh, blind, uh, and uh, now I need bifocals. 
And I didn't realize, I can't really read this, but that's so helpful. It's like large text reader for me. So, um, empirical formula, something you should have covered in Chem 300, but we are going to go over it because we want to do a lot of these problems. Empirical formula, abbreviation EF. Whenever I use an abbreviation, I try and give you the words and then the abbreviation. If there's ever an abbreviation you don't know, just let me know. Uh, molecules with covalent bonds. Glucose has a molecular formula of C6H12O6. Its empirical formula is the smallest whole number ra uh, ratios there, so it's going to be C1H2O1. Where the ones are not necessary, you don't have. Uh, you can, but you don't have to write them. And in fact, you'll typically see it like this for empirical formulas. The ones are just my placeholders to let me know that I've solved the problem and I know those numbers. Many compounds with different formula with different molecular formulas can have the same empirical formula. I've got some listings here. This is nomenclature that we don't have to know, but they're my guides. And um, the only reason those are there, and as I will say from time to time, everything we do in this class as much as possible is for a purpose. The purpose of these is to let you know that all of these molecules are different molecules, and in chemistry, Every single different molecule has a different name, and it's very systematic, and we will touch on it in this class, and we will revisit it, uh, or you will revisit it in Chem 401 next semester. But these are different molecules, even though they have very similar formulas, and even though they have all the same empirical formula, all CH2. Or C1H2, it doesn't matter to me. Any questions about that? So the name, nomenclature is this nomenclature you don't have to know. And then down here, even compounds with the same molecular formula can have different structures. These are called, these are called uh, structural, I'm sorry, that is a typo. It says isotopes there, doesn't it? It means structural isomers. I apologize, let me fix that. I-S-O-M, M is in Mary, isomers. Uh, for example, C2H6O. I'm showing you what's called a Lewis structure there. We will do Lewis structures later on. However, I just want to show you um, one of the structural isomers and what we will get to in chapter nine. I'll show you another one. And the only thing you have to know now is that those have the same molecular formula, but different actual structures, structural isomers. Now, what's going to happen is when you solve problems on your second homework, we're lecture. Uh, we, I am lecturing on your second homework because there are no lectures on your first homework. Your first homework is ten pages long and it is all review from Chem 300. So I don't need a lecture on it because Chem 300 is the prereq for this class in a perfect world. And if you don't remember any of that stuff, then uh, now's your chance to, to um, refresh your memory. And of course, come to office hours and get help. But anyway, so we're lecturing on homework two. Um, and on homework two, some of the empirical formula problems will say, Solve for the empirical formula, then solve for the molecular formula, then Google to find the name of that compound. And what you're going to do is you're going to find many names for some of the answers because there are many molecules with the same molecular formula. And any one of those will be fine. 
just don't forget to do it because it's usually, if I grade that one, then it's usually worth some portion of the points for that problem. And that's the easiest part of the problem is to get those points for Googling. So, all right. Uh, any questions about that? Oh, and these have different names too, just like these. This is ethanol, this is acetone. No, that's not acetone. This is uh, dimethyl ether. Acetone has three carbons. And this is ethanol. So um, I would guess, so, uh, like in a first semester Spanish class, there are some words you just have to know. And on your nomenclature sheet, you'll find a list of what are called common molecular compounds. It's like 20 or 30 of them. Ethanol's on that list. So, and I think all you have to know for ethanol is the name and this molecular formula. We don't have to know any Lewis structures. Yet. So, does that answer your question? Another one, yeah. Just a notification on your phone. I don't know if it's interrupting the video. It says low battery mode. Um. Huh. It's still going. This will show well in the video. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll have some of it anyway. It didn't stop it though, so, but thank you. Uh, now I hope I don't run out of memory. It looks like I'm almost out of memory. All right, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Well, uh, molar mass, uh, we'll do one problem with this basically. Mass of one mole of molecules or formula units. What is the molar mass of ethanol? I'm showing you the formula here. As far as the molar mass, you might want to sort of put all your carbons and your hydrogens and your oxygens together. Sometimes that's simpler. I will say this. By the end of this class, we will be able to understand and interpret this version and turn it into this. But that's a little um, Molar mass of ethanol, uh, we'll do this the long, drawn out, boring way, so you've got it. So we've got two carbons. When we look at the periodic table, of course, the periodic table tells us all the numbers underneath the molar mass of carbon, typically four significant figures, so 12.01 will be fine. If you use this many, it's fine as well. Don't use 12. <laughs> use 12.01 for um, sig figs, please. So that's carbon. Just to say this once, that number represents the average molar mass of all isotopes of carbon naturally occurring. Um, and there's such thing as carbon-12 and carbon-13. You're averaging over all the isotopes. Same thing for hydrogen, 1.008 is four sig figs, and that's fine. For oxygen, 16.00 is four sig figs, and you're good. Add them all up, and you get the molar mass for the compounds. Add all of these up, you get 46.068. And I will turn that into four sig figs. Now, in lecture, 
homework and discussion. Basically everything except lab. Four sig figs for your molar masses will be fine. In lab, we'll do sig figs entirely correctly if you want to score full grade. Any questions about part A? Let's move on to part B. For part B, how many hydrogen atoms are in 32.3 grams of ethanol? The method that I use to solve all uh, stoichiometry problems is called the picket fence. What the picket fence does is it organizes your unit conversion factors. For example, my molar mass is a unit conversion factor that says there are 46.07 grams of ethanol per one mole of ethanol. And that is my unit conversion factor. Having said that, that's only the way I do it. There are many ways to do stoichiometry problems. You may do them your preferred method, and I will always be able to mark it and see what you're doing. On homeworks and exams, um, you'll see that starting with homework two, I tell you when you have to show work for problems and when you don't have to. That's how specific this homework is going to be this semester. I'm very excited about it, by the way. Did you know that over 50% of the problems on your uh, written homeworks after homework one, homework one we use the same every single semester, and homework one is actually for all Chem 400s at Sac City College. Right? It's in your lab manual, for goodness sake. Right? Everybody uses it, and it's a, it gives us all an even starting point for all the sections. But from there, I make up 50% of your homework problems new each semester. And it could be as small as tweaking the numbers. Oftentimes, I change the whole problem. The reason I do that is because I want you to do your homework. I do not want you to Google the answer. And if you Google it, Googling is fine. I'm not against Google. What I'm the, uh, against is Googling, copying the answer down, and not understanding what you're doing. So, buyer beware. When you're doing my homework, right, you're going to find a lot of problems are tweaked. At least 50%. Some of them are not. And what I'll be looking for when I grade your homework is for you to have not noticed that I tweaked it. And you give me the Google answer. So... And I said this this morning, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it this afternoon, too. Do not cheat on your homework. Do not copy anything. If you look at your classmates' homework, and that is allowed, synthesize it for yourself, because if you copy it, you will get a zero. Put in your own words. Do the math yourself. Right? Make it your own in whatever degree you want. Now, so Google it. You can't find the problem. Uh, you're at home. It's uh, Saturday night because everybody does their chemistry homework on Saturday night. And I'm not answering emails, or you email me and I haven't gotten back to you. And you Google it and you find a similar problem. Put it in your own, look at it. Use that resource. I'm fine with that. In fact, I encourage that. And then come back and do it yourself. Put it in your own words. Okay? Anyway, so there are, you'll see as you go, you'll be like, crap. It's not Googleable at all. What am I going to do? I guess I'm going to have to learn how to do it. Or I guess I'm going to have to ask a question. Or I'm going to have to form a study group. And you're playing right into my evil, evil hands. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, you know, I am, my background, by the way, I'm an engineer. I'm a chemical engineer. I'm teaching chemistry. Uh, and that engineering has given me, among other things, a practical side, which is I think you should practically learn as much as you can, but you have to be efficient. And if Googling the answer for your homework gets you the points, do it. I just ask that if you copy, and I may not know all the sources, but I know a bunch of them, um, that you, you, can, you risk getting a zero one. So put it, you know, change the numbers, may, you know, don't, and this is the example I gave this morning, 
I think it was something like, you know, somebody in the past wrote 2.19 grams, and then somebody copied off of them and put 2.199, because they couldn't tell the difference between a 9 and a G, but I could. Zero for both the copier and the copy. And that's in my syllabus too, but please work together. Please just think about it. That's all I ask. Any questions about that? Um, I did chag my homework problems last year. You know, very few of them were there. And the ones that were there, I rewrote. <laughs> And again, it's all, you know, the other, I mean, it's, uh, the other part of that, by the way, is we, we all then start on a more level playing field, right? We're all, that, that's the goal, really, is to help you learn to, um, anyway. Uh, where were we? Um, we were back here, we'd gotten to moles. What are we, we were asking about H atoms, okay. Now, H atoms is kind of a, a, a vague, it could be moles of atoms, but I'm gonna interpret this as actual atoms using Avogadro's number. Um, and if you were doing your homework and it said H atoms and you gave me moles of atoms, you'd probably pull credit, right? Anything, anytime the question's uh, not precise. But you can always also ask. In one mole of ethanol, there are six moles of hydrogen. And again, if you stopped there, you'd be fine. But this one, I'm going to go to actual atoms. And I think what I did is I revised all my homeworks to say actual atoms and not moles of atoms, to be clear. It's a constant search uh, to try and be more clear for you guys. So then I use Avogadro's number. One mole of anything, but in particular hydrogen atoms. is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms. Now uh, multiply all of the numbers across the top, divide by all of the numbers at the bottom. Please consider always bringing calculators even to lecture, but also for sure to lab and discussion. You can work this out uh, and... <laughs> uh, does anybody know what the answer is? I don't know why, but the answer is not on my page. Thank you. I realize actually now, it's not on my notes, but I usually do the chemistry boot camp, and I didn't this year, but I usually remember that answer. They did do chemistry boot camp last week for Mesa, right? Um, we should talk afterwards. I'd love to hear how it went. Any questions about this? Uh, I'll say this a couple times. Uh, for test prep on exam day, if you got this question and you weren't sure whether I wanted moles of atoms or actual hydrogen atoms, you can ask during the exam. So. And what I do is, for any question that is clarification based, I will answer it. If there's any question that gives away the answer, of course I can't. But you will never know unless you ask whether I will answer the question. So you can always ask. Okay. Uh, this one. So a couple years back, uh, uh, or actually last, last fall, uh, seems like a long time ago, I came up with, at a student suggestion, the idea of companion problems. Those are ones that are in the lecture notes that I don't work in lecture, but I post the answers on my Chem for Honored website. So if you need extra practice, this is a companion problem, and you'll find the answer online. Okay, actually, the whole thing is companion problem. which means we'll keep going. Uh, 
Ah, significant figures. Perhaps, I don't know. Uh, as I've said, I like to think of myself as a practical person. My uh, thought process is that in lecture, we will focus on the chemistry concepts you are learning and not on keeping track of sig figs. In lab, we will focus on sig figs and you will lose many points for not doing correct sig figs. So what this says is, uh, in lecture, discussion, homework, quizzes, and exams, everything except lab, your molar masses should always have four significant figures and your final answer for the problem should always have three significant figures. Exception, pH. pH will always have two decimal places. And we'll talk about pH in a couple chapters. Um, and of course, if you do sig figs correctly, you will always get full credit too. I would never knock you for that. But what you'll find is the vast majority of my homework questions have three sig figs in the problem statements, and therefore the final answer should have three sig figs in it. Um, do not write down all the digits on your calculator for your final answer, um, and because you will lose points. Now, if you write down all the digits for all your midpoints, or if you do all the digits and you underline the third sig fig, those are fine. Just final answers. I don't want you telling me that the final answer is nine digits just because you're talking. I know I know Ah, so. Let's say your calculator tells you this is the final answer. But uh, you can tell me that that's the three sig figs that you're trying to show me by underline. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So. And in lab, we'll tell you the same thing. Let's say in lab, there were supposed to be four sig figs, so you underline that one. Yeah. Me in lab, your answers always have the correct number of sig figs. In lab, though, you can always ask me to look over your work, and it is the sig figs that we are focusing on among them. Any questions about that? Is there a key to the A and B questions? These questions are on the answer keys are on the website. Yeah. And you guys are fortunate because last fall when I made these, <laughs> I didn't have the answers and so I was busily writing them. But they they're already up there. And the only thing I will say is that every once in a while I switch companion problems. And so if you go there and you don't find one because I switched it, and I don't think this happened very much, but if you can't find it, let me know and I will always post it. Um, part of what I will do is there, the Kempfer Under website will have a lot of answer keys for you. And um, among, so that's where we'll put the companion problem answer keys, that's where we'll put the discussion section answer keys, and that's where we'll put the homework answer keys when, when once your homework's turned in. Well, the homework one might, the answer key might be up there already. If it's not, it probably might be there before you turn it in, because it's really Now, homework two. Homework two, it might be up there already. Um, the homeworks, the written homework, starting with homework two, will all be green. Green is my favorite color, by the way. And, um, and I, I will always print them out and bring them to, uh, for you to class. So, um, sorry I don't have homework too here today. Any other, so you, you got your answer? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, are we able to print out ourselves if we want to? Yeah, so let me, um, I haven't touched the website in about a week. If homework two isn't there or anything is ever not there, just email me and I'll make sure to post it and I'll email it to you directly too. I can't remember. What yeah, so, um, no, in fact, I, uh, I, the reason I'm sorry I didn't bring it is because I would like you to get started on it now. Now that we've, uh, or well, the first problems are some empirical formula problems, um, and we will get to those today. Uh, let me say another word about homework. Homework will be broken down into two uh, parts, multiple choice and short answer. 
Uh, a couple semesters ago, we only had short answer homework, and the uh, online homework was the multiple choice. We have now, due to student popular demand, eliminated online homework from this class. Um, I think there's a lot of pros to that, um, and so hopefully you will find that to be a pro. Good. Any other questions? Percentage composition by mass. What is the mass percent carbon in benzoic acid? Uh, percent composition by mass. Uh, another way of saying that this is how you get information in empirical formula problems. in empirical formula problems. It doesn't always say percent by mass, it'll just say percent composition. But percent by mass is pretty common, it has a number of ways of referring to it. What is the mass percent carbon and benzoic acid? Where we have the formula right here, and we will want to uh, abbreviate that by putting all the carbons, all the hydrogens, and all the oxygens together. Well, that helps me. There's a couple different ways to refer to this. I've chosen this one right here. Percent carbon, mass by mass. That's going to equal the mass of all carbons in the formula. formula. Divided by molar mass of molecule. Or formula unit, so we're hedging our bets here because molecules are for covalent compounds, but we will do this, especially on homework two, for ionic compounds as well, so formula units. Times 100%. Plugging that in, we have seven carbons, 12.01 grams per carbon. That's what I mean by all the carbons in the formula. There are seven of them. Over the molar mass of the formula, that's going to be all of this. We're going to assume that you can do that. And you get 122.12. And you should get 68.8. Carbon by mass or mass by mass. Any questions about that? What is WW weight by weight? So at least if we do everything, if we if we adhere to our Earth-centric model, mass and weight are always proportional. So. This example, the liquid in an intravenous IV bag is 0.9% sodium chloride. How many grams of sodium chloride are there in a 1.00 liter bag of this solution? Assume that the density of the solution is 1.00 grams per milliliter, the same as water. How many people uh, already knew that the density of water is 1.00 grams per milliliter? I will ask that you remember that because that will be very handy as we go through this class. So memorize. Water has a density of 1.00 grams per milliliter. It is true the lab number one does measure the density of water, and we will see that the water uh, within a range right around one, the density does fluctuate. 
but it'll be like 0.999 or 0.998. And so that's pretty close to one. Oh. Uh, things that are, that are important, and this is one of them, I put boxes around. And things that you don't have to remember, I tend to put parentheses around. So one kilogram per One kilogram per liter as well. Now what I'm going to do is um, when like I I I'm going to use this formula because it's 0.9 percent. And I'm going to plug it in and say the mass in this case of all sodium chloride in IV bag. of the IV bag. And so this is a different application of the percent by mass formula. We're not necessarily dealing with, well, here's a molecule, but it's the mass of the entire bag. And what's important for percent composition is that whatever's in the numerator and the denominator have the same units because the units cancel and we're left with percent. Over here we had grams and grams, or grams per mole and grams per mole. Here we're going to have grams and grams. But we've been given liters, not grams. But then we've been told that, we, that the density of solution is one gram per milliliter. If we have one liter, we have, well, one kilogram, which is how many grams? 1,000 grams. And however you get there, so, uh, and I'll do it explicitly. Well, there's the unit conversion. I guess the numbers are kind of simple here, but, well, you know, if this had not been one liter, this would be the unit conversion factor. One liter equals exactly a thousand milliliters. And here's where the density comes in. And we're converting the liters into grams. Scientific notation is the better way to do it, but this is sort of our in-between work, so we could use either of those ways of identifying a thousand. Now the only thing we don't know is our mass of all the sodium chloride in the IV bag. That's what we're asking for. How many grams of sodium chloride are there in the IV bag? I don't know how you solve this type of problem, but I do cross multiplication, whether it's in my head or long and And I know that this is 100x times 1 equals 0.9 over 1,000. This is the math that you have to be able to know how to do over and over and over again in this class. And so ask for help if you're uncomfortable. But what you get here is x is 9.00 grams of sodium chloride Answer written the three sig figs, regardless of how many sig figs are in the problem, because that's what we need. And so, if you've ever had an IV bag, they're almost all the same. They may have other good stuff in them too, but they all have nine grams. 
bags. Or, I mean, I guess there are different types of IV, IV bags even, but basic one with uh, salt, nine grams of salt. Any questions about this? Ah, uh, empirical formula problems. We're actually, and this is a little weird, but this one is a companion problem. Its answer is already online. We're going to do the next one, which is very similar. There we go. In fact, they almost look the same. Now, if you're looking for a hierarchy of how to study for the exam or how to learn the material for this class, what you will find is that companion problems, because we do similar problems to them in the lecture notes, they're sort of your basis. So it's a great idea, especially after lecture, uh, to go and try the companion problems to see if you understand what you're doing right after you've been told how to do it. Okay. Great idea. And they tend to be pretty straightforward. And then there are discussion problems. Discussion problems range from just like these to harder ones. And the homework problems tend to be more like the, or tend to be yeah, harder than the discussion. Well, discussions range, homeworks range, but they can be, they tend to be in general harder. And so, if you want to prepare for the exam, knowing and being comfortable with the thought processes behind homework questions is where you want to be. Okay, you want to be able to discuss the thinking, you want to be able to solve them. And what you will find is on the old exams, the problems, they come actually from all the different places. But if you can do the homework ones, then you're fine. Hopefully. I mean, that's my goal. We'll say your mileage may vary. Okay. Um, but what I would do is this problem actually is a good problem to do. Does this problem look familiar? Uh, morning discussion people. We did this one this morning because they hadn't hit, had any lecture. We'll do this one now. Uh, this is an empirical formula problem. It says a compound has the following elemental analysis. It tells you the percent compositions of three elements and asks for the empirical formula of the uh, compound. Now, um, for those of you that were with me this morning, percent composition, as we just did, percent by mass, is grams of carbon per 100 grams of sample. That's like the reverse engineering of that percent formula or percent by mass calculation. And now we have, instead of percent, grams of each of the elements, and grams per 100 grams of sample. But it doesn't matter what it is, and there are actually, of course, multiple ways to solve empirical formula problems. My method goes like this. Use all of these as grams, turn those grams into moles, Turn those grams into moles, and then compare the mole ratios to find the empirical formula. I'm going to write all those up here now. Do the math, I will do it. Uh, we get 
8.046 moles of hydrogen and 2.703. Now we'll say a couple things about those numbers, things which I've said this morning, which is for empirical formula problems, it is often helpful to keep four sig figs for your work. Because what's going to happen is, when you keep four sig figs, even though there's only three there, your ratios will work out crisply, cleanly, and neatly. And if you only keep three sig figs every once in a while, something will be off. Well, I don't think we'll see that this time, not in this problem, but some of the homework problems that are well, the next step is to divide by the smallest number of moles to get, hopefully, small whole number ratios. I have 2.703 down here. When we do this, best of all math down here, we get a perfect one. When we do it, here we get 2.98. When we do it for carbon, we get 1.499. Yes? You got 3.98? Hmm? I don't know. Let's see, eight. I thought that should be 2.9. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Sometimes it's a, I, I'm always happy to check. Um, let's see, because when I went back and I said this, so this is almost three. So to be above three, this would have to be above nine, like close to nine. Yeah. Um, back to 1.499. In this class, you can see empirical formulas with half numbers, third numbers, and quarter numbers. That means that if you see a fraction with 0.499, it rounds to 1.5. Not 2, not 1. If you see 1.333, that's actually 4 thirds. And you can get down to quarters. That's why you need that fourth sig fig, is to differentiate things like 1.333 from 1.252 and things like that. The other thing I'll say is, if they're not this close to small whole numbers, Go back and check your math. It is very easy to mix up numbers in these calculations. But the nice thing about empirical formula problems is they always work out beautifully. You must get small whole number ratios in the end. And if you get 1.42 as your ratio, that's not close to anything. Go back and look at your numbers. And I'm happy to, go, and I'm happy to look at them too. Uh, What's, uh, sometimes what I have to do with these is I have to work them myself because when I look at a whole bunch of empirical formula numbers, the numbers are like, oh, they all look right. And then I work it myself. So sometimes reworking the problem. This one is three. Now our uh, formula is so far C1.5H3O1. That is not an empirical formula because it does not have small whole number ratios. What are we going to do to our numbers to get small whole number ratios? Multiply them by two. Multiply them by two. And you have to multiply all of them by two because they, they have to stay proportional. And we end up with 
C3H6O2 is their empirical formula. And since that's all we were asked for for this problem, this problem is not. Now we'll talk about hydrates. This is uh, not a companion problem. And there's definitely a hydrate question or two on homework number two and on discussion uh, for empirical formulas and combustor analysis. Problem says a mineral contains a hydrate of nickel 2 sulfate with an unknown number of waters of hydration. And there's the formula for this, uh, where x is unknown. If a 0.400 gram sample of mineral is heated to constant weight over a Bunsen burner, its mass decreases to 0.296 grams. What is the value of x? Well, the key for this is that heating a hydrate drives off all H2O. Heating a hydrate drives off all H2O. And of course, in the lab, it's a little more complicated than that. But in this problem, all of the water, like it's like uh, here we are in the outermost layer of the chemistry onion. It's got all the waters or it's got none. In the lab, it can't be used. Okay, so we started with 0 0.400 grams of this. We heat it, and its mass decreases to 0.296. This, so we drove off all the waters, so the only thing left is nickel 2 sulfate. How much water is left? Well, uh, all we have to do is do the subtraction. to find that there are 0 0.104 grams of water that were driven off in this process. Now, um, I have just put this problem in the same format as this. It is an empirical formula problem where we are looking for small whole numbers, except for with hydrates, there's always a one here. So that's what we have to figure out is what that x value is. Okay. And the other thing that's different is instead of elements, we now have compounds to look at. Okay. But otherwise, the process is the same. And we have grams of nickel sulfate, we'll find moles. We have grams of H2O, we'll find moles. And then we'll find a ratio between them. The molar mass of nickel sulfate, 154.76 grams. We do the same thing for the H2O, 18.02 grams per mole H2O. Zero point zero zero one nine one three. Again, I'm keeping an extra sig fig just to make sure everything works out. This in my head is another type of empirical formula problem. 
far as scientific notation goes in this class, uh, I use whatever is more convenient. If there's only a couple zeros, I sometimes put them in. Sometimes I'll write them in scientific notation. I'm not real choosy about that. Zero point zero zero five seven seven one moles of H2O. Now we're off to divide by the smaller number. Smaller number in this case is going to be the moles of nickel sulfate. And this time we get which is our x. And the question asks, what is the value of x for this hydrate? It is 3. And we'll talk about naming hydrates. And probably next lecture. I don't think it's, it's, it's a lecture or two out. Um, but the name of that is nickel 2 sulfate trihydrate. And there are no spaces in there, as we will see as well. Everything's run together. Um, any questions about this? I forget where you got the value. Oh, this value? I chose, of these two, the small one. Oh. Um, any other questions? Good question. Let's see. Um, the next slide is a big topic. We're actually going to stop a few minutes early. Mm, hold on. No, we're not. We're going to keep going. It was tempting, but we can make read. Like, I don't want to just do nothing, you know. Oh. Did we pass another? Yeah, we passed another companion problem. Let me get the format right here. There you go. So this problem with Accutane is going to be a companion problem. I'll say a couple words about it though. It says Accutane is found to contain 79.95% carbon and 9.40% hydrogen with the remainder being oxygen. What do all the percents add up to? 100%, so you can by subtraction find the oxygen. One of the uh, things that I do sometimes is this with the remainder being oxygen. I don't tell you, and you may assume that the remainder is oxygen. And you will know that the percents always work out to 100%. Uh, you have its molar mass. The molar mass is necessary to find the molecular formula after you form the empirical, find the empirical formula. So this is a companion problem as well. It's on the, on the side. Now, there are two types of main types of problems in this lecture. They are empirical formula problems and combustion analysis. And we'll start talking about combustion analysis. Now, um, combustion analysis is a process that burns an unknown sample containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in oxygen to produce CO2 plus H2O, uh, carbon dioxide and H2O. From this information, the empirical formula can be found, add in the molar mass, and you can find the molecular. Combustion is actually our first reaction type. There will be about six types of reactions that I can ask you to write. This is the first kind. We're only going to talk about it a little bit in the next few minutes. But let's say we have a compound that contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but we don't know the subscripts. So we've called the subscripts X, Y, and Z. Combustion analysis adds oxygen 
which allows whatever this is to burn. Okay? And in fact, combustion analysis is the way that you typically get this data. So this is one, this is peeling back one layer of the chemistry onion to get closer to whatever this thing called reality is or the real world. I'm not sure. But then what you're going to form is carbon dioxide plus H2O. Typically we don't, I mean it's shown as a little blob here. The initial substance could be solid, liquid, or gas. Oxygen is going to be gas. Carbon dioxide is going to be gas. But the H2O? Well, the H2O depends on what the temperature is, at least in part, if not all. And what I'm going to suggest is that when combustion occurs, it occurs at a very high temperature. So at least when this H2O comes out of here, it's going to be gas. Now, over here, you're going to have things that are cooler, and it will eventually become a liquid. But we will write combustion reactions with H2O as a gas, because combustion occurs at a high temperature. Now, Do you see this carbon on the reactant side? Where does it all go on the product side? Yeah. It has to be here. So I can put an X here. And now I know that coefficient already. What about the hydrogen? All this hydrogen goes where? Water. Water. has to be y over 2 because there's 2 in the formula and there's only y of them over here. What about the oxygen? We cannot balance the oxygen to find anything with Z because there's this oxygen as well and we're not keeping track of it. So what we will do, and we'll talk about this next time, this will be the natural break in the lecture is we will know how much carbon based on the amount of carbon dioxide. We will know how much hydrogen based on the amount of H2O. And we will then have to find by subtraction the amount of oxygen. So I'm just going to write down here, find oxygen by subtraction, and that's the last thing we're going to do. And that's a popular theme, which is know all the elements and then find by subtraction the other one. That's it for today. Uh, lab, for those of you who have it this afternoon, we'll start at 2 o'clock. So uh, and I'll open that up in a couple minutes. Now uh, we can trust it.